Hello, you guys, and welcome for the very first episode of Trojan Conquest Live. You asked for it, and here it is, our off-season show. Uh, you guys have been clamoring about it in our DMs all day, and uh, we're now here to provide it for you. Our show has always been about you guys, the viewers, right, of Trojan family. So Rick and I um, are here to represent the Trojan family as alumni and season ticket holders. We've both been season ticket holders for decades. Uh, we bring about a combined 75 years of watching and attending USC football games together. We appreciate the fact that Mark Rogers gave us a, a voice uh, last season to do a postseason show with the amazing Tony Altimore. Um, and we thought we'd just have an off-season show because you guys have asked for it. So um, we're really looking for you diehard Trojans to do something with us in the off-season. We're excited to provide you with this show. This show is going to be a little bit different. It's going to have a tailgate atmosphere where all of us Trojans get together. We can talk about storylines and hot topics, things that have been on everyone's minds or on the tip of people's tongues. Um, but a big reminder, this show is about you guys. So we welcome your comments. We welcome your questions and suggestions. And we're going to do our best to get to all of them throughout the show. So uh, go ahead and, and put them in there. We will keep track of them. And uh, we will try to get to them at the end of the show. So, Rick? Hey, great to be back with you, Tim. Everybody that's out there, we appreciate your patience. Tim, relax, man. Oh, I'm having a great time. Our we're, we're first episode, right now. we had some technical difficulties. And Tim's a little bit... Um, He's a little bit uh, high strung right now, but Tim, follow me. Breathe in, relax. We got to oh, work you out. Got this, Rick. You're the we one that's really, really nervous, though. We're, we're good. Ready to roll. We're ready to roll. Like Tim mentioned, hey, thank you guys for joining us. We had, um, again, thanks to Mark Rogers for uh, having us uh, do the USC postgame show. We've had a lot of response about, hey, when are you guys going to do? You should do an off-season show. So here we are. We're going to start um, you know, covering this off-season with a show a week. Uh, next time, hopefully right at 5 o'clock. But we appreciate your patience. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to have some different segments. Um, and like Tim had mentioned, it's kind of like a tailgate. When you go to a tailgate, everybody's anticipating the game. They have their opinions, um, what's happening with the program. We're going we're gonna to bring that to you. So pull up a chair, grab a drink, enjoy um, our discussion about USC football. What Tim and I are going to bring to you is our passion. Like Tim had mentioned, we're both alumni, season ticket holders. We're invested in the program, and we have a gr good working knowledge, a great working knowledge of the past, the present, and what our opinion is, what's going to happen in the future. So with that, let's rock and roll. Tim? Are you chilling? Are you are you feeling better? Well, I'm just making sure we have all of our graphics ready. We should be all right. Okay. Well, cool, man. Then um, why don't we um, start the tailgate section? And Tim, I think you're going to start off with um, with a question. Yeah. So when you're at tailgates, you know, a lot of things are being bounced around and stuff. And a lot of times in sports, it comes down to numbers, right? So. Um, I'm thinking about a number here, and uh, what would be the first thing to pop into your mind if I told you uh, the number USC, the Trojan number five? Reggie Bush. Reggie Bush, yeah. And so last week, you're absolutely right. Reggie Bush, last week, uh, a lot of news on Reggie Bush. Um, he's the, uh, his birthday was on March the 2nd, so happy birthday to Reggie Bush. But also um, some good news for Trojan family. Uh, we have an evil man uh, that has decided to retire. Actually, it's official now. Uh, a lot of you guys have followed the Reggie Bush case. Mark Emmert was um, the president of the NCA that handed down the sanctions to, to USC. And, um, you know, it's going to be a it's going to be a blight to stay in on his on his watch. The fact that he let this go down the way he did that the draconian sanctions that we were given uh, the fact that he took uh, the man's trophy away from him. You know, Reggie, anyone that watched Reggie Bush play uh, realized that he was, he's a guy that should be celebrated. He's definitely should be there in the Heisman house and people loving him and giving the attention that he deserves. Uh, but unfortunately that was all stripped from him. We've seen a gradual move from the, the USC administration. Uh, recently they had a tweet before the Super Bowl where they talked about the fact that there's only a few people that have ever, I believe three people that have ever, won the Heisman Trophy, the national championship, and a Super Bowl. 
And uh, this was the first time I remember USC tweeting out about uh, Reggie Bush and an affiliation with with uh, with a Heisman Trophy on their official Twitter. So I think we're starting to see some momentum. I think we're starting to see um, a lot. Oh, also in the fact that Reggie Bush recently was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame. So it's not just the USC family that's welcoming him back and acknowledging the great achievement of winning a Heisman Trophy. I think that this is a clear statement that it will probably be the fact that, you know what? Hey, it's time to give the man his trophy back. Uh, Reggie deserves it. He's, he's absolutely amazing. Charlie Parker, you're the new NCAA president. What a great way to start your watch by being the guy that, that fixes this wrong and gives what pretty much everyone, except for probably, I'd say, some Notre Dame fans, um, now some hateful Oklahoma fans possibly. Everyone else knows this man deserves his trophy, so it's time to give him back. What do you think? What do you think, Rick? Well, obviously, yeah. I mean, Reggie should get his Heisman back. Um, it wasn't going to happen under Mark Emmert. So happy birthday, Reggie Bush. Uh, adios, Mark Emmert. Um, the best thing he did was resign in his decade of destruction of the NCAA. Um, the guy whimpered out in the last 18 months. You heard hide nor hair in one of the most uh, epic changes in college football history with NIL, the transfer portal, realignment. And basically it was a ship without a captain for the last uh, 18 months. So nothing was going to happen when um, Mark Emmert was here. There was no way Reggie Bush was going to get his Heisman back, even though there was discussion, a lot of things happening um, right around the national championship game. Reggie was tweeting out Charlie Baker, the new president. He's going to be exploring things with NIL, working with Congress and creating um more of a of an understanding to benefit the student athletes it will come under his watch it'll happen uh until then hey i think we said our piece give him his heisman back yeah i'm also um <laughs> see my spelling here sorry um correct yeah he he absolutely should uh have it and i think it's a matter of time so rick you know let's say where we're hanging out what numbers do you have for me yeah man let's start off the tailgate again we, we talked about number five. I've got a number in my head, 62. What do you think when I hear when you hear the number 62? So the 62, um, I would think right about, I think the, the 62 national championship team. Um, but I don't think that's where you're going. No. no. Hey, you, you gotta, dude, you got to relax, man. Just, huh? just feel, breathe in for me. Breathe in for me. It's okay. It's okay. Am, am I stressing you out? Yes, you're stressing me out, man. It's oh. okay. So there's 62 have been the national champions. Yep. I could probably think about maybe, uh, no, that's not long enough. About 62 days until the game. I'm not sure. What's 62? It's been 62 days, almost. It's been 62 days since that debacle at the Cotton Bowl. That loss to, to, um, to Tulane in the Cotton Bowl uh, will be basically – 63 days from tomorrow. And so that's the last we remembered USC football. And it's taken me that long to actually get over that, that game. Seriously. No, uh, we saw what we saw. And that's the beautiful thing about college football, man, is um, we took a lot of grief and rightly so, because who in the heck gives up? Was it 16 points, 15 points? I think it was 16 points in like four minutes. So defense was non-existent, uh, and we're going to go down as losing the two lane. Congratulations to two lane, but we move forward. So it's been 62 days since that ridiculous um, bowl game. No worries, man. So developing news this, this past week, Gary Patterson is stepping down from his analyst role at the University of Texas, his defensive analyst role from the University of Texas. And if you follow Matt Zemeck on Trojan's Wire, he, he uh, had a story. Lincoln Riley needs to give Gary Patterson a phone call. If you're not following Matt Zemeck, I think you should. He does a, a weekly show with Mark Rogers, all the boys of college football, the USC show on Monday nights, 8, 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 Eastern. And he's wondering if um, Gary Patterson – 
uh, should get a phone call from Lincoln Riley. I, I think Lincoln Riley probably already has given him a phone call. And maybe that's why he stepped down. Tim, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, he could be looking I don't, there are other possibilities. I don't really know too much about what Patterson's thinking. Could be anything from family to a bunch of things. Maybe uh, looking for maybe NFL positions. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe another analyst job, maybe a head coaching job sort of down the line. Uh, but what I do know is that I think it would be a really awkward situation for uh, Lincoln Riley to hire him as an analyst. It's almost like saying, because like Grinch obviously feels the heat going on right now. And you bring in a guy like Gary Patterson as an analyst, uh, that's going to ratchet up that heat a lot. My concern would be um, you've given him this vote of confidence. And I agree. I think it'd be a great idea. I'm, I'm 100% on it. If you could get a guy, we saw what that, that Texas defense uh, did against Alabama at the beginning of last year. So, man, listen, if, if, we can, if we can get a guy that can scheme like that to help out Grinch, the questions are is, you know, how, how compatible is Grinch's um, – system and schemes along with Gary Patterson's. There's a lot of things that are involved in what would come into it. But if it was just simply to help you to scout and and to uh and to manage the defense, I would I think it'd be a great hire. My question would be though, if you're Alex Grinch, Rick, uh what message does that single to you? Well if you're Lincoln Riley, you make this phone call. Whether or not Gary Patterson comes, that's a whole nother story. But you don't let potential hurt feelings by Alex Grinch stand in the way of making the phone call. Um, Lincoln Riley brought Alex Grinch. Okay. And he brought him here. And for one reason or another, the defense didn't execute at the level it is expected to, especially the last three, four, five games of the year. You take a look at USC schedules next year. First six games, very manageable. Last six games are going to be challenging. And that's not even counting the, a potential Pac-12 championship, nor a college football playoff. And you're the head coach. The defense is the issue. Um, we've seen championship game, uh, championship teams at USC. It's all predicated on a solid defense, whether it's McKay, Robinson, Pete Carroll. Now, we know the offense is phenomenal, but the defense – we need another – if we can get another set of eyes like a Gary Patterson, basically to take a look at our personnel, take a look at the transfers coming in, um, you know, practice film, what, what these guys excel in, what they, what they need to develop on, need to develop in terms of their game, scouting the other teams, as you had mentioned, Tim, very critical. Um, there's, there's, that's what these analyst positions are for. So somebody like a Gary Patterson, you have to bring a guy or consider bringing a guy like that in to improve your defense because it's all about developing talent, depth, and um, anything you can do to improve your, your, your defense, which is basically step one. Um, you, you do it. You don't worry about hurt feelings at all. Yeah, no, I think it goes beyond hurt feelings. I'm with you. I mean, th listen, um, Lincoln Rye is the CEO of this company, right? He's, he's, he's a guy. He's the captain of the ship. What he says goes. My my concern is is sometimes you if you you can bring some discord into a locker room, you know I'm not saying it, you, these, some of these guys are going to be Grinch guys, and then you're going to have you might have a lot of just just I don't I'm worried about the synergy they have. I I think that you know you're making a good point. Like we talked about the fact what he brings to the table. I'm not sure if it's a slam dunk as much as we would think. I think bringing Patterson in as a defensive coordinator, if you wanted to take that position uh, next year. If uh, let's say things don't work out with Grinch, I'm not calling for his job. I'm not saying that he, you know I think he's gonna fail. Um, I will go into that a little bit later. But I, I do say that I see him coming in as a defensive coordinator. Um, and again, I, I'm also assuming that these two don't know each other, right? I mean, the the the, uh, the coaching community is a small small world, so there's a really good chance these guys know each other. And hey, if they if they click, if they feel they like could work together, it would be. Having someone of his talent would be, again, shown last year against that game. I keep going back to that Alabama game and how the, the for some reason, I'm sure they schemed all offseason for them. They just didn't have an answer uh, on Alabama. And we know that Alabama has the athletes. So I'd love to see what he could bring. I'm curious if it, what the benefits would be would be enough to take the risk of maybe upsetting the apple cart. my only point. You're not going to upset the apple cart. Lincoln Riley, he's the CEO. 
it's no, it's no uh, question. It's no mystery that the one thing he needs to improve about his team is the defense. And this is an opportunity to, again, he's not coming in as a defensive coordinator. He's not coming in to replace Alex Grinch. He's merely coming in as another set of eyes, an analyst um, in a program that needs a fresh set of eyes to take a look at the defense. It's not changing scheme. In fact, I believe during the off season, Lincoln Riley had the assistants, the defensive assistants, a meeting, communicate with Alex Grinch, the way they look at the defense. Everybody had their input about how to move things forward. This is just another step of trying to move forward and um, put forth the best defense possible out there in Caleb's in Caleb Williams last year. Simple. Excellent. Yeah, so it'll be interesting how this thing shakes out. Uh, this is like a little unsubstantial rumor. Uh, I, I think you all should go check out what um, – what Matt Zemek had to write, I dropped the link in the chat. So if you want to check that out, please feel free to uh, to give it a look. So moving on. So we know that you know on basically in, in football, there's there's three parts of football, right? Um, and uh, so during this section, we really move towards away from like the rumor and the speculation into a situation where we begin to talk about the. Uh, what's going on on the field? Actually, the players, right? During the game, game time is about players. It's about the plays, about the Jimmys and Joes, right? The X's and O's. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what we think is going to be going on, the storylines that will be happening in spring ball. There's three parts of it. There's offense, there's defense, and special teams. I think we're going to focus on the offense and defense today. Uh, special teams will have its own part later on down the road. But Rick, what do you think about the offense? I think the offense is fine. Let's move on. Yep, I agree. So basically, the the, the defense is a real issue for this team. Uh, the offense is going to be easy. I totally agree with you. So, Rick, what do you think about the defense? Oh, where to start? Um, I I think that um, you know obviously the the key with the defense is you know, points per game. Any improvement we're going to make. It's going to be on the defense. The defense is about depth, providing depth and development. That is what's going to be key right now going into spring ball. What I'm most interested in watching, uh, where they had off-season workouts, everybody's working on their fitness. We've seen all the videos. Every team sees this every year, their fan base, just to get them stoked, keep them involved in um, you know moving through the off-season. So really, it's it's kind of – I'm looking at – the transfer players that we got, how are they going to improve the defense? The players that were injured last year, um, who who can who can add to the, the potential depth? The returning players. I'm also looking at uh, the injured players, and how are they going to replace some of the, the players that have, have moved on, like a Tuli, and um, like Nick Figueroa. How are they going to replace Makai Blackman? So um, I, I take a look at you know, the program moving into right now and this second year of recruiting and transfer portal activity, definitely uh, you can see the upgrade in talent um, versus the first year when, Hey, Lincoln Riley was hired, but it was all talk. There was no, there was no actual um, games to, to, to take a look at. And, you know, there weren't any games that were played, but now you you have a full season, eleven and three. Uh, you have a you have a you have some history. You have an upgrade. Um, tell me what what do you think about? Let's let's start with. Um, well, let's how, take a look at it. Going? Right. Yeah. So let's take a look at it. Let's let's start with the key losses. So we know we lose Makai Blackman, shutdown corner, awesome for us last year. Tuli Tuli Pelotu led NCAA division uh, or the Power Five in ta tackles for loss and sacks. And then you've got Nick Figueroa, who was a role player, um, had his strengths in moments, but, um, you know, uh, had his struggles as well. So um, on those losses, what do you think? Well, the, the key thing is obviously those guys were, were critical, but the, where, where USC has to focus in on, and we've talked about this before, is the front seven. It's provide, it is, it's, it's, um, you know, luckily, Thule was uh, was healthy all year. 
But uh, you, you saw when we had some key injuries you know, with like a uh, Eric Gentry and other and other key players, we just didn't have the depth. So the key here is developing the depth for next year, specifically the front seven. I like our secondary, a lot of guys, a lot of guys in there, but um, in terms of who's going to provide the, the pass rush, that's going to be a, a committee. You just don't replace Thule. So that's what I want to see is wh- who's developing at rush end, who's developing on the line. Um, great. Where, where are we going to get the, the depth? Who, where, where are the depth pieces? How are like a Jack Sullivan from Purdue going to gonna fit in with? We'll, we'll get to him. We'll get to him, Rick. Let's stick to Let's go. So, yeah, so there definitely be keys coming in, but those losses are, are going to be difficult to fill in, but we are looking to um, add to them. So one way that the Trojans have added to the to the roster right, is uh, is through the transfer portal. So um, there's some key players uh, impacting uh, the starting lineup. There will be some storylines. Some of them may or may not start right away, but we can start off with uh, Chiron Bars. He's the transfer from uh, Arizona. He's a big guy. Uh, what do you got to say about Bars? Well, Bars is he's he's got some some reps. He's played at Arizona. He's familiar with the Pac-12. Um, he's going to be a piece that can a player that can step in right now and have the ability uh, to start on the defensive line. Um, and it's 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 basically uh, and this is where SC is going to excel. Where they've been excelling is in the transfer portal. So he's a proven player. We can step right in, have the opportunity. He saw a few players from um, other schools in the Pac-12 step in and be critical um, contributors to USC, specifically um, Mackay Blackman from Colorado last year uh, on the defensive side of the ball. He also saw um, players Gentry. From, Gentry from ASU step in. So, yeah, there's an opportunity for him to, um, to play on a defense that, that needs some help. And so speaking of help on the defense, one of the big problems they had was with the pass rush. And if you look at the guys that are coming in all over from either, you know, coming from the uh, the freshman class or from transfers, uh, a lot of these guys, we have a lot of rush ends coming in. We got some big, talented guys um, that are fast, quick, uh, and look to get some pressure on that quarterback, maybe making the job in the secondary on the, uh, on the back level a little bit easier for everybody. So um, how about Jamil Muhammad? He's a transfer from Georgia State. I know that there's a lot of excitement about about him and his ability to rush the quarterback. Um, so it's an upgrade from, I believe, that the transfers that we were getting at that at that position last year. And mainly, you know, we had a rush in, but unfortunately, um, uh, Romello Height, the transfer rush in, uh, transfer from uh, Auburn, uh, hurt his shoulder, I believe. In the, in the Let's save him, year. Rick. Remember next guy. <laughs> He's I, next. I, I understand that. I'm just, I'm just getting into um, here's a guy who's going to compete at the rush end position and where we were thin at that position last year, mm-hmm. really didn't have um, much production at the rush end uh, position. So uh, I think that the coaching staff is looking at this guy as having an opportunity. And that's obviously why I think Jamil made the, the, the um, decision to come out to USC. And we got a couple more rush end guys. We have uh, Anthony Lucas and Jack Sullivan. Anthony Lucas is the big name we heard a lot about. He was the originally a five star commit to Texas A and M. Uh, ran into a little bit of trouble there, and has found his way through a transfer portal. What are your thoughts on him, Lucas, the next season? Well, I think the more guys that you have competing, um, the better you're going to become. And you know, Lucas has an opportunity here at USC. It's um, obviously. The competition level is probably not as much as it is at Texas A&M, meaning that, that uh, you know, our defensive line, to, to have a successful defense, it starts obviously on the defensive line. And we just don't have the numbers. You look at the successful teams in the SEC, you know, your Georgia, your LSUs, your Alabamas, they have 10 guys that they can rotate. And USC needs the depth. And that's what we just don't have. If you're going to be a successful defense – you know, come time in late October, November, December, when it's championship time, mm-hmm. you cannot be worn down. And USC was worn down last year defensively, and we saw it. Um, you you finished the season playing four ranked teams, and it showed. It was very difficult for USC to be you know successful. 
they played against who was it? We finished the season with um, with uh, UCLA, Notre Dame, Utah in the Pac-12 championship, and then Tulane. So um, show me another team in the country that played four consecutive ranked teams. Um, and those are teams that are ranked at the end of the season as well. So if USC is going to be um, competing for championships and Caleb Williams last year, and that's what we do at USC, then you're going to have to develop and have depth. And so Anthony Lucas is part of that equation. Yeah. Um, and so it wasn't, it was, depth is huge, right? You saw a lot of the injuries stack up. You, and remember, just because a guy's in the game does not, he's not playing hurt. So these injuries do stack up. If the guys are getting lots of reps and not get able to maybe rest those injuries they possibly could do, that does uh, pay a toll towards the end of the season. And then again, there's the, the issue of having, you know, the level of talent. Uh, there were a number of three-star defensive linemen, and I am never one to speak ill of any Trojan, um, especially those who are going to spill blood on Howard Jones Field, you know, and sweat and tears. So, but maybe the players we had in the past, um, I'm not the one to top this. It was actually Lincoln Riley saying that he thinks that last year's roster may be the worst that they ever have. So um, that said, getting some, maybe improving some of the talent as well as building that depth that you're talking about will be huge going forward. Uh, so then um, Sullivan is also the, the Purdue, I believe uh, he is a, a proven commodity. He was, uh, I think he led the team in sacks. He's a big guy. Also good against the run defense. Any words for Sullivan? I think you got a, you got a graduate player. He's going to, you know, he's going to, again, provide that depth. He's played in the big, the big 10. Um successful player they made it into the big 10 championship game last last year against michigan against michigan so a proven player who can step right in and contribute and one of the one of the challenges we have when we're talking about front seven is uh that tackling display at the cotton bowl and a number mm -hmm. of other, other games getting gashed because you don't have that push you don't have pressure on the quarterback um and tell me about what you think of Mason cobb transfer middle linebacker, uh, linebacker yeah. from good segue. I was, I was going there next good segue with the, the poor tackling so this guy's a tackling machine uh he had upwards i think near 100 tackles last year uh we need the guys the, the trouble was we're talking about it was in you know the second line with our linebackers a lot of the issues had to do with the um the lack of getting pressure in the passing game lack of pressure on the quarterback but then when it came to running, it just seemed like the run fits were, you know, we kept waiting for it. It got a little bit better. We thought that it was getting a little bit better, those run fits. Um, but that one gap uh, scheme that they're running, it just seemed like a lot of times, number one, they weren't setting the edge. The linebackers did not have that lateral movement to the sides in order to make the plays. And I don't want, I'm, I don't want to say anything negative about the guys leaving, but I think we're bringing in some proven tacklers. Um, uh, and one of them would be uh, Mason Cobb. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the competition for that Mike linebacker position or what direction they go for, you know, go with that position. There's so many linebackers. That's going to be interesting coming out of this camp is who got, you know, I, I know none of us can go to any of the, you know, fans can't go. And I don't think even the, the uh, press can watch the, the practices. So we're going to have to go off of guess what we're hearing, but um, I, I'm interested to see how, cause they, they, they work it to where the linebackers, uh, start out in many positions and practice in many positions. I'm wondering where out of spring camp, some of these guys are to go and maybe some of the movements, the guys that are playing rush end, how many of them are going to stay at rush end? I think there was someone talking about the fact that uh, at rush end, it looks like Corey Foreman might be moving um, from the rush end to the D line. So that's going to be, that might be, you know, he's going to have a hand in the dirt. That's going to be interesting to look at for it as well. So moving yeah, on from, I'll oh, go ahead. Definitely. And you know, the one last critical transfer that we can talk about, not a front seven player, but he's uh, he's stepping in to, to replace Makai Blackman or has the opportunity to, and that's Christian Roland Wallace. He's a, uh, you know, uh, I believe three or four year starter with the University of Arizona, physical uh, cornerback. And, um, you know, he's got the opportunity, again, to step right in and uh, compete for a starting job. Yeah, I'm not sure if he's coming to the same fanfare that we had with Makai Blackman. But um, but he's he's proven himself to be a solid uh, a solid tackler as well as a guy cover out there. Um, I'm I'm interested again. I'm I'm hoping that we 
we get more pass. I, I don't think the issue was with our secondary as much. There were some issues in tackling, but as far as coverage, it seemed like they did well for most of the season. Anybody's going to get open. There's going to be holes in, in any defense if they, you give the quarterback too much time. So uh, I'm happy with who we have there, which leads us into um, another group of guys that might have an impact. That'd be the guys that are the red shirting. Now we split this into two categories. The first category would have been the guys that are red shirting uh, that because of medical reasons, right? It's the guys who were injured. So we're talking about guys like uh, uh, Zion Branch, uh, Domani Jackson, um, as far as the secondary is concerned. Uh, I think with uh, Zion Branch is great because we're finally to get some more athleticism on the back end. Uh, I'm, there's no knock against the guys that played safety last year. Uh, but having Zion Branch back there uh, as an option is going to be huge. The guy, speaking of huge, you know, he's a big guy. He's like six foot two, 205, 210. I don't know how big he is, but he's a big guy and athletic. And speaking of big and athletic, you got a corner in Domani Jackson who was hurt last year as well. Both these guys are going to come in. They're going to add size. They're going to have athleticism and speed to the position. Uh, Zion Branch, I think it was a top 50, top 60 uh, recruit. And we know Domani Jackson was a five-star, one, one of the top uh, players in California, if not the top defender in California. So what do you think about those guys adding some uh, some depth and some competition to the secondary? Yeah, no, I mean, you, you, you laid it out well, Tim. There's, you know, we take a look at the transfers. We got six defensive players that we talked about uh, that have transferred. And then you talk about the red shirts. Another one um, uh, didn't red shirt, but he was hurt was Romello Height. We talked about him, the rush end from Auburn. So we really didn't see Romello Height. So if you add Zion Branch, Damani Jackson, and Romello Height, there's three critical players that we didn't have last year. You add those to the transfers, that's nine players that we're looking at. We're talking about that defensive depth. I really like what uh, Zion Branch uh, can bring. Um, again, I think he's he's like 6'2", 2, 205. Uh, but he's a physical guy. He's been, he, he's a, um, he's a, uh, I believe he was the number uh, one or two player out of the state of Nevada last year. Um, and, um, but him and his brother, Zach, these guys, these guys, uh, um, they definitely work out. They're physical, they're kids, they love football. So he's going to give us that physical presence in the secondary that, that we can we can use. He's an athletic guy, Domani Jackson, speed, uh, great cover guy. He had a little bit of playing time last year, but you know, coming off an ACL, uh, critical time of the year, towards the end of the year, got some reps, but maybe wasn't really um, at his full potential. Now he's going to have another off season to work, you know, to work out, learn the defense, a, a fall camp. He should be re you know ready to go and past the injury situation. And, and we don't know with Romello Height. Again, he had a sol shoulder issue last year, but again, he is in the mix with uh, the other rush ends and competing for playing time. Whether he's going to start or not, who knows? Hopefully he's healthy, but he's going to add to the mix and improve improve uh, the room. Yeah, those those shoulder injuries are nasty. That's, that's the one joint. It's really weird. And uh, we need to hear linemen with shoulder issues. That sometimes can be a, a lingering thing. I'm hoping whatever I got taken care of and, and he can move forward and have a successful season this season. Um, moving on from uh, Mellow Height. Well, one thing also, you guys out there, if you're if you're hearing that name Branch, we're talking about Zachariah and Zion Branch and your Raider fans, you guys might remember Cliff Branch because uh, that, I believe, is Rick, is their uncle? I think, I'm yeah. not sure. I think it was an uncle. Oh. So there, so there's uh, so those two guys. Believe me, once you guys, if you haven't seen them yet, if you haven't seen their high school stuff, uh, get ready for both these guys because they're playmakers and they're big time. And we talk about them. So then we have one more category uh, when it comes to uh, the red shirts, and that's the guys that maybe needed the bulk up, maybe needed that extra season, maybe just for whatever reason needed to get right in order to play. And that would be Garrison Madden and Devin Tompkins. Um, Rick, I know we know that Garrison Madden. He's a uh, uh, he's fast. He's a fast linebacker. I'm not sure. Is he from Texas? I think he's from Texas. Um, he's but from, he, uh, he's from Georgia, Georgia. He he is a dude that has speed um, and speed for days. So this is, if you want to think about a really fast linebacker, this guy, and I'm curious to see, I don't know what his cover skills are, 
but he seems like he might be a, a little bit of a uh, an answer to some of the problems we have, the not being able to get out and uh, on the perimeter and make those tackles. What do you think about? And then De- and Devin Tompkins, uh, he's a uh, a rush end, big guy, uh, but didn't play much football in high school. He's like a basketball guy. I think he switched over to football. Uh, he's been bulking up. He came in a little bit light at 230, added about 30 pounds. And now I believe for spring, they're listing him at 260. So, uh, Rick, what do you think about these two guys and what they can add? Yeah, starting out with Devin Tompkins. This guy is my under-the-radar player to watch out for um, next season. I think, uh, as you had mentioned, Tim, he's he's a basketball player, primarily a basketball player, and out of Stockton, California. Uh, I saw pictures of this guy last year during the spring. He, got, he was getting yoked, um, and he's put on 30 pounds, so he's at 260. He's been – you know, in the program for a year, he's learning the defense. Um, and now we'll see if he takes that jump and competes for some playing time at the rush and position. So really looking forward to Devin Tompkins. He's my under the radar guy that most Trojans maybe have heard about a little bit, but obviously he didn't play last year, but he's going to really um, compete for playing time with guys like Romelo Height, Jamil Muhammad, um, Jack Sullivan. Um, again, this is a guy that can provide depth. And if you take a look at the other guy, Garrison Madden, yeah, a lot of lateral speed, quickness. Um, and so I think they're really high. The coaching staff's really high on him because, again, they do put a value on speed. And, and, and let's, let's see what, uh, what he can do at the second year of the program. So, again, two additional pieces um, of the front seven that will be looking to provide some playing time and some depth to the Trojan defense. Okay. Um, before we move on to the third, uh, sorry, the, the fourth and final impact piece we wanted to talk about. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. I want to apologize to Matt Ritson. Sorry. Thank you for the uh, super chat. Um, you said this about a half hour ago. I'm sorry. I just missed it. I was going back to look. Uh, he says that uh, USC is helping Washington and Oregon bring to big 10. So I'm assuming that you're saying that USC is helping that wants Oregon and Washington to the big 10. I have not heard that news. Rick, have you heard anything along that line? No. I mean, what you hear out there is, let me tell you, Matt, thanks a lot for the super chat, but uh, what you're hearing out there, nobody knows because one day it could be, (laughs) uh, it's, it's basically people's opinion on social media. Nobody knows. And if they tell you they know they're lying. So is USC helping Washington and Oregon, uh, bring to the big 10 are we helping them go to the big 10 uh, everything i've heard is no um but there's not a big 10 commissioner n- right now i know that they petitioned or put in their application back shortly after usc and ucla declared that they were leaving for the big 10 but from what you know the the former big 10 commissioner kevin warren basically said yeah thanks we got your application but we're not accepting it right now so who knows but um I think SC and UCLA are just fine at the Big Ten with or without Washington and Oregon. I, I know Washington and Oregon would love to be there, but uh, we'll have to see how it all plays out. Right. Um, okay. And then, so moving on to our last um, thing for the night, uh, sorry, this category is going to be your your freshman impact. You know, the guys that are going to impact um, on the, the, the freshmen that will make the biggest impact the season generally you're, you're not really looking if you are looking for freshmen to make an impact on your team you're probably very disappointed obviously they're coming in smaller this is a big man's uh, a grown man's strength kind of game uh, so usually especially on the line they're not ready to play right away but there are speaking of grown men there's one guy in particular in this group i mean i'll get to him in a moment um but uh he appears to be a, a man among boys and and that's uh that's tackett tackett curtis uh, from Manny Louisiana, he's an inside linebacker, a tackling machine. He's drawn comparisons to a Brian Cushing. Um, and so we're, we had a theme here, talk about front seven. We're talking about tackling, and we're talking about getting some size. I think that he checks all the boxes. What do you think, Rick? Yeah, there's. Uh, you don't expect your freshman to play, um, especially on, on defense. A lot of times the size isn't there. Um, and there, there needs to be development, especially when you're going from high school playing, you know, playing power five schedule and 
you know, the teams that USC is going to be playing and, and, and looking to compete for, for championships. But Tackett Tack Curtis is a different breed. This kid from, you know, what I see and what I've read um, is that, you know, this kid's dedicated to football. This, this is, that's what it's about. I mean, it came down to, um, I believe, Ohio State, USC, and Georgia. So, uh, or, or was it LSU? It was LSU or Georgia. But, you know, this guy was, was, is a player. And, yeah, you mentioned the Brian Cushing uh, comparison. I also think of him as a Matt Grittigood. The guy's always around the ball. He's got a nose for the ball. So he's going to make his presence belt. He already is. Uh, the guy's, you know, workout fiend. He's, he's quick. He's fast. He's a hard hitter. He's definitely going to show that, that he, I mean, he, he's going to want to play. And he's going to eventually get on the field. Um, so I don't know when that's going to be, game one, two, three, four, five, what, but he, Tackett Curtis will be playing on Saturdays for USC, no doubt about it. Yeah, they'll bring him along slowly, I'm sure, because, again, we have guys like Cobb, and there's a lot of other uh, players that are going to be fighting for that linebacker. But I do see a talent like him. When you talk about six foot two. he's 220, so he's a bit on the light side, right? He's more like a safety weight there, like a big safety. But um, I, I do hope to get him uh, pretty soon. And if he can be – you just named guys like Grudegood, and I said uh, Cushing. If he could be a fraction of either the guy, these guys were for USC, uh, I think we'll be looking pretty good at Mike Linebacker. The only, right, thing so, concerned, the only thing I'm concerned about with Taggart Curtis <laughs> is that he's going to hit too hard. And with our Pac-12 refs, oh, we're going to—he's going to get dinged and potentially kicked out of games. So, well, look, you know, he's from Louisiana, and I see that John Delon's out there. Our, our one of our friends from uh, who's an LSU fan, so he knows what who? I'm talking about. John who? Delon. Oh, John who? Delon's in the chat. So, you know, this kid is from SEC country and they play football differently out there. At least that's what they tell me. And that's what I see. And our PAC 12 refs don't let us play. And um, I, I expect even tighter, tighter uh, refereeing against USC and UCLA this year as our going away present. So we are, uh, we're going to be under a microscope. So the only people that can keep Tackett Curtis off the field are going to be the refs. Yeah, and John Delon actually brought up the point. He said that they finished for LSU, finished fourth. And you got to remember, there's a lot of times here, even in California, we think a guy from Southern California is coming to USC. You know, sometimes these kids just want to get out of where they are. You know, so not necessarily the hometown. Sometimes the hometown school like LSU might have nothing to do with the coaching or anything. It might have to do with the fact that he just wants to get out of Louisiana. So we're lucky to have him. And that's that's a that's a great pull for the Trojans. Um, and then you have Braylon Shelby, staying with our our, our front seven kind of. Uh, Theme we have going, Brandon Shelby is a monster. Uh, he is going to be another guy who's going to be pushing for that that rush end position. This guy's got athleticism for days. Rick, what do you got to say about Braylon Shelby? Well, I, lo I love he's the, he's the um, rush end from from Texas, and this is a this is a this is a guy who I don't know if he's necessarily going to get any playing time next year, but I like I like the the uh, I like Braylon Shelby and the potential that he has. He's got size and speed, smart kid, loves football, and that's the type of kid that you want in your program. I think uh, he's definitely going to be uh, pushing the other players uh, that are in the room. Uh, but I, I think that, again, he's going to provide depth. This is something that we really didn't have on the defensive side of the ball, recruiting-wise, when Lincoln Riley stepped in in um, – late November of, uh, what was it? 2020, uh, 2021, right. He had a, a few weeks and we had a you know, small recruiting class, what, like nine high school recruits. And then we had like, um, 20 transfer portal guys, but we didn't have the numbers defensively. I like this recruiting class better in terms of the, um, defensive pieces, uh, high school and transfer portal. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, he was, that was a cheater me bringing him in there. Cause I, I correct me in chat, you guys, if I'm wrong, but I don't think he's actually an early graduate. I don't think he's going to be participating in spring ball. So that will also probably slow down his, his yes. um, development. Yeah. But we probably will not see him early. I'm hoping maybe he will shine enough to get on the field late in the season. Okay. And then another freshman. This guy is kind of a freak. Well, not a freak, but he's just, he, he has the, the things you want. You can't teach height. Maliki Crawford, six foot four corner. Here from right here from California. What do you think, Rick? What do you think about Maliki Crawford? 
Well, yeah, you said it's six four, and you know what I like about it is this guy's got speed, athleticism, he's got length, and that's what they're looking for in the secondary. And uh, I mean, six four, my God. So what that tells me is, guy's got a wingspan, and he's going to be perfect in the situation where we're looking to create turnovers, tipping that ball. How many times do we see balls get tipped? Um, specifically, Eric Gentry, you know, tipping tipping balls. Um, in the middle of the field. And uh, um, I saw Max Williams was, was fortunate to get a few of those interceptions on tip balls. So um, I like what the future holds and definitely Maliki Cro- uh, Crawford's size and athleticism is, is a plus. So looking forward to seeing uh, him develop. Yeah. Um, okay. And then I think we want to move on a little bit quicker. We'll, we'll, I'll jam through this a little faster for us. So, uh, then you have a safety in, in, in Christian Pierce, uh, David Peavy, uh, Sam Green, Elijah Hughes. A lot of these guys, again, are D-line. You got, uh, you got Pierce at safety. But um, do, do you see any of these guys that might be an impact, uh, let's say, just early on the season or all the season? Yeah, no, I, I, I just think these are development pieces. Uh, I like David Peavy out of San Diego. We won the recruiting battle against Oregon uh, from Lincoln High School. Um, They've got some good defensive players that have gone to Oregon. So getting David Peavy um, was a plus. Sam Green uh, out of um, the DMV area. This kid's an undersized kind of nose tackle, but boy, this guy's aggressive. He loves football. He he wanted to be a Trojan and he's kind of unheralded, but this guy is going to work. So that that guy's another name to look forward, forward to in the future. Again, Young guy, don't know if he's going to – chances of him getting on the field, who knows. But you know that he's going to be working. Uh, Elijah Hughes, another uh, defensive line development piece, and Dejon Lafitte. Dejon Lafitte is a local kid out of Colony High School, Ontario, California. So you can uh, – this is what I like to see. These guys are uh, three stars, but a lot of times the three stars get developed. And um, – Hey, anybody that's being recruited by Sean New and brought to USC, I trust Sean New. I trust his coaching staff, and they've got the opportunity to start building the room. And that's what we talked about: defensive depth, building the room. Iron sharp, sharpens iron. Um, and these guys know: hey, if they stand out and practice, there's going to be opportunities. I mean, there's opportunities on defense for days. Yeah. For sure, and I, I like the fact you brought up the uh, the fact that that we were able to um, get that recruiting battle with PV. Uh, today we're not going to go into NIL and and how uh, and as far as the the, the uh, plan that the current coaching staff has for freshmen. Uh, we'll go into that a little bit later, but it was interesting to see uh, again. You might want to take a guy like Garrison Madden at six four, you know, six five two thirty five, uh, and, and as a loss. So right now we're saying that the big storyline was the fact that um, they lost out on Mateo Uyungale, right? And he went up to Oregon, but the, the situation might be, let's, let's take a look at it in a couple of years and see where Shelby and um, Uyungale's careers are. Uh, you never know. I, I do believe that a lot of times the recruiting rankings are very accurate, but uh, it's going, it's hard for me to say uh, against my Bosco Braves, but it might be interesting to see, you know, where these two guys end up. So everyone was melting down over Oregon winning these recruiting battles. Remember, everyone wanted Braylon Shelby and USC was able to land him. So um, really quickly before we leave this topic, uh, there's some needs that still need to be filled. I think that one I hear all the time is the fact that it do, still seems like we're a bit light on, uh, as far as defense, on the offense, we're, we talk differently, but as far as defense, it looks like we're a little bit light still in the interior defensive line. Uh, they want to bulk up on that. Do you have any uh, ideas or any position groups you think might need help? Well, like I mentioned, it's the, in my in my mind, it's the front seven, and we specifically viewers in the chat. Thanks a lot for for coming to our premiere episode uh, for the off season. But everybody knows that the Trojan, hey, the offense is fine, nothing needs to be fixed. Uh, so we're specifically talking to you about the defense today because we know what championship teams look like, and and really, it's the front seven. It's it's the uh, we, we've outlined it today. It's the it's defensive line, it's linebackers and rush end. And right now, there's opportunity at each of those positions. And we had some some guys that stood out, you know. But um, 
at the same time, the the uh, the pass rush wasn't there consistently. You you, you got to figure out a way, and this is what you do right now in spring: is how are you going to replace Thule? Okay, I, you know, and then there's guys that, that are returning from last year that you know Tyrone T- Teleni, he flashed. He had a key sack in the game against UCLA. Sure, Corey Foreman, he flashed. He had an interception, his biggest play, I think maybe his only play of the year uh, against UCLA, which pretty much sealed the deal. Thank you, uh, DTR. But um, really, it's it's the front seven that has to has to develop, and that's hopefully what we're going to be seeing. And that's really all I'm going to be looking for this offseason is what is happening with the um, the front seven. And, and what you're going to see too, Tim, is and I want to get your perspective on this, is it's basically spring ball is show me what you guys have learned. Uh, let me see how big you got in the offseason. How well are you adapting the playbook? How well are you playing in spring ball? How bad do you want it? And there's going to be guys that are going to transfer out after the spring game because that portal window, final portal windows, opens up May 1st to the 15th. How many portal guys do you think that we're going to get and what positions? If you had a yeah, to, be, to be as honest with you, I really haven't put a lot of thought of that. But one thing, it goes back to the Pete Carroll years um, as far as what we didn't have last year is you don't have guys pushing the top guys at their position. Uh, when, when you had, it was always compete with Pete Carroll, right? If you go to a number of schools, you go to an Alabama or a Georgia, your job's never safe because you have young guys, you have transfers coming in, arguably going to fight you for your position. So this year, having the ads we had, guys like we talked about with Branch and Jackson, Height coming back healthy. Uh, overall, this spring camp, I think it's going to be huge competition at linebacker. Um, there's going to be huge competition. We were talking about at that rush end position. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, you know, iron sharpens iron or whatever the, the phrase is that you're looking at guys now that have been infused into the program. And it's not my words. It's, it's coach Riley's words that, uh, they had, uh, a roster that's most likely going to be the weakest roster they'll ever have in their tenure at USC. Well, this, uh, this group that's going to come to challenge a lot of these guys, uh, is going to bring a lot of competition. And through that competition, uh, some guys may leave. But if they leave, then that means that they just weren't winning a position. So that'll open up positions because, as I said, we're probably going to need to fill a couple more defensive uh, interior line positions. And I'm not sure where we are. I think we're over the limit or at the limit right now on scholarships. So you can expect some people to leave and probably hopefully add a couple more down the road. Yeah, I, I think you're going to see anywhere from five to seven players that are going to leave after spring ball. I don't know which positions. This is just a feeling you look at these players that are red shirt, junior, seniors that haven't got on the field. You know, they might get their degree and say, call it a day. Uh, there was an example of offensive lineman, Jason Rodriguez. He he made that decision eh, probably like a month ago. And um, but there's going to be a come, come a time after spring ball, and there's going to be an opportunity to get some more guys from the transfer portal to provide some more depth, competition, and um, you know, stock up on the, on, I, I believe we might get uh, another offensive lineman, a few more defensive linemen and a linebacker. That's, that's what I see. All right. Well, listen, you guys, it's at that time of the show, we're going to probably go over some of your chats. Thank you guys. A lot of you were very active in the chat as well. I've also dropped the link. If anyone wanted to call in, uh, we're kind of over time now, but we got started late. So we'll be around for a few minutes. Anyone wants to call in, give us your thoughts on the USC program. Otherwise, uh, Rick, let's just pump a couple of these uh, comments out while we're waiting. Sure. So the first one uh, here uh, is uh, from Ed Rogers, who seems very uh, pessimistic. He says, will Utah curb stop us multiple times again this year? Can I start? Um, I think okay. without rising, and I got to be honest with you, I was a big rising fan until I saw that interview he had after the, uh, co- uh, after the, uh, the championship game. And my my uh, thoughts on him went went down severely. I know they've got a a young, very athletic, very fast quarterback behind him, but I think with the defense, uh, the defensive players, the Jimmys and Joes that we're adding to the X's and O's, I think they're going to fit uh, Grinch's scheme a little bit better. Um, we the, the the first one we barely lost. the The second one, which was definitely not a curb stopping. And if you want to talk curb stopping, it was a, it was 
you know, uh, like a 10 point game. It could have been a three point game if, if uh, we hadn't thrown an interception. So if some butts or anything, I don't think that you guys have uh, at Utah, you guys don't have the players to match up with USC. And uh, I think our offense has scored a hundred on you guys this year. What do you think, Rick? Tell me how you really think, Tim. Oh, that's exactly how I feel. <laughs> yeah, no, Ed, you know what? You'll be able to sleep at night. The game's in the Coliseum. Uh, I don't know if rising is going to be back. I don't, you know, nobody really came out and said what his leg injury was, but it was a serious leg injury. Usually that could be an ACL. I don't know if it's an ACL. There's been discussion about that. But if it is an ACL, he's not going to be back by the time the season starts. No way, no how. Uh, and if he, if he is, well, then he's got to go up against Florida and Baylor back to back. Good luck with that when your primary skill as a quarterback is running the ball. You go off platform and run the ball to set up the pass. Um, and you're going to need to be fleet of foot because we know what happened when the pressure uh, got to Cam Rising down in the swamp. He threw the pick. Okay. So he's they're going to come to the Coliseum. I'm not really worried about Utah. If you're worried about Utah, then you should just stay at home because we're going to take care of Utah. Not a problem. Next question comes, question comes from Connor Johnson. Connor Johnson wants to know where Tony is. Tony um, is uh, working right now. Uh, Tony's a very busy man, and he has other commits, so he can't join us every week. But uh, we miss Tony more than you do. So uh, he's like, he's probably, it's like the Three Musketeers without without D'Artagnan or something, right? You, you're, you're missing a piece of the puzzle. So we will we will hopefully have Tony come in when he has time. He's working on a number of things, but those commitments keep him from coming every week. Uh, next one is here we go. The biggest problem faces this team. The quandary of state of football is in. Uh, I, I not just very vague. <laughs> um, I, I think that the, the issues that are facing USC football, I actually, a lot of these that are hurting other programs are not hurting USC right now. We're not worried about conference expansion or, or our conference going away. We're, we're aligned to the big 10. So that's out of the way. I think the way that USC has aligned themselves to finally getting some new NIL going, um, that I think there will be okay in the transfer portal. Uh, and then uh, are there any other issues you could think of there, Rick? Um, LBC Rob, thanks for the question. Thanks for tuning in. I'm wondering if this is LBC, who people were confusing me with, and he said, hey, I'm going to have to change my name. And um, so this could be LBC Rob. I, this is the guy. If, if this is the guy from on Matt Zemick and um, Mark Rogers show on Monday nights, but um, LBC Rob, thanks for your question. Welcome. Um, no, it doesn't affect USC the quandary of the, of the state of of college football right now. And a lot of that, LBC Rob, if I'm listening correctly, it probably has to do with the back and forth that has been happening for the past month between realignment with the Pac-12 and the Big 12. Okay, it's it's nauseating. It's the reason why USC got out of the, the Pac-10 uh, or the Pac-12. Uh, we are fine. We are not in a quandary. Oregon, Washington, the rest of the Pac, uh, the Pac-10 uh, is in a quandary. If you listen to uh, the Big 12 mouthpieces, such as as uh, who's that dude? Brett McMurphy. Uh, or if you listen to Sikkim 365 or you listen to MacGyver, whatever his name is, MacGyver on, on Twitter. Yeah, that, that that's the quandary. And the other quandary is, is and you're starting to hear it from Florida State. Florida State's like, we can't it really exist in the, uh, the ACC because we're, we're not going to be able to be financially solvent. Um, and wow, they're talking, they're lobbying for unequal revenue sharing. Well, yeah, that's why USC is has left the uh, the Pac-12 is because when it became the Pac-12, we had to agree to equal revenue sharing, and look what happened. Pac-12 mm -hmm. is is what it is because we had poor leadership. We had a TV deal that never got distributed, and you add ten years of that, and it's adios. So we didn't backstab the Pac-12. The Pac-12 screwed itself, and uh, we are not in a quandary. Yeah, I wish I could remember the person that um, said it's, I watched so many shows. Uh, They're talking about the fact that uh, USC was making more than Alabama before they went on their run with Nick Saban. 
before this, they re- yep. they, they changed the TV deal with, with USC and the Pac-12. USC was actually making more money on their TV deal than Alabama was because it had to do with, you know, you basically whatever you're bringing in is what you were getting. And USC was a hot name. So uh, this new deal really did help uh, the rest of the conference. Some of the smaller Pacific Northwest um, schools made, made out, making equal share to USC and the LA market. It was probably great for 10 years. It helped out your program. But the end, I think, is probably what killed the conference. So uh, another one uh, with from LBC. Oh, sorry. Uh, we have a caller. Thank you. So Robbie Latham joining us. Welcome. Welcome to the show. Rick, Tim, what's up? And yet, yes, Rick, it, it is the other LBC. I hey, Denver. Rob. Hey, welcome, man. <laughs> Thanks for calling in. What are you talking about? What are you guys? Uh, Tim, again, pleasure. And uh, and and, uh, and Rick, I why well, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I, 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 I hate this Big Ten thing. I absolutely do. But I, I don't have a better idea, and I don't think we had much of a choice. I, um, I, I just it, it's. It's the state it, of the whole thing is just it reeks of, um, OK, we're paying the players now. We can really exploit them. Let's and I mean, like I said, you know, Nebraska chased that Big Ten money and then they went from switching from the option to a pro and then this thing. And now they don't even really know who they are. Colorado was second in the Big 12 before they moved to the Pac-12. Now they're, they're happy to have Dion use them and they're and they're thanking him. It's just it's 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 sad, but I I don't know I don't have a better answer for it. Well, hey Rob, thanks for calling in. We appreciate you being on our first show here in the off season. Appreciate your support. Let me um, and I'll, we'll we'll go into this in more detail. And that's part of what the show is going to be about because we've seen a lot of SC football and um, we've studied a lot of SC football. And let me tell you. I am licking my chops that we are going to the Big Ten. You can go back and look when USC won championships. Take a look. We all know what Pete Carroll did. Okay, Pete Carroll won seven BCS bowl games. He beat Michigan twice in the Rose Bowl. He beat ten Joe versus Big ten. What's that? Ten and zero versus the Big Ten. Yeah, ten and zero versus the Big Ten. If you look at uh, John McKay and um, John Robinson. 47, 40, 40 wins, seven win, uh, losses, and one tie. That was from uh, 1960 to 1982, okay? USC owned the Big Ten. Okay, this is like the SEC doesn't like to go travel. USC no. was traveling in the 60s and 70s, okay? Imagine what like air, air travel was like back then. I mean, we were traveling 1,500 miles to go play these teams, Okay. Um, so it was I like, a, I'll, I'll yeah. share with you. Yeah, it was a bit. So yeah. I, I, or I was, I'm, or I was a walk on, or I'm not, I don't, uh, you guys can see who I really am. I don't want, that's why I changed the LBC Rob so people can't see what a bad player I was. But um, they, uh, uh, it, um, they, uh, or, um, I, I was at the 96 Rose Bowl team. I was of uh, the Kyle Brad Otten split. Oh, okay. Um, I could get, I could, well, I could, or I, I can give you the thing of how, if you remember that team was ranked seventh before the Notre Dame game going yes. into that year, Keyshawn's and the thing we're going and, mm-hmm. and this is just the one thing Pete couldn't keep from happening once or twice a year. They tell it as how we're SC or so good, wherever. And Lou Holtz did that. Hey, we might be playing the best team in the nation. Da 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 da. And, and we kind of start believing that, you know, something we are that good and then go happen. And it was cold there. J Rob would not let us wear sleeves. Uh, that kind of threw us off at first. And then it just, it, it snowballed from there. Kyle came in and tied it, but they went with Brad again at halftime. And that kind of split the team, which was more kind of a Kyle team in the first place. It just, um, you know, and like I said, and the same thing with the at the both games at Oregon State and Peace game. The most thing is just every time if it, I don't know what it's it's like. I said I grew up with I played against Steve Sarkeesian since the seventh grade. I've known him thing. He still has it. When they think he tell him he's a good coach, he starts this starts to feel it and whatever. He starts thinking he's better. It is. It's something. It's like the Southern California curse. I can't explain it. No, I hear you, man. And even in Pete Carroll's. Tenure, 
you had the games that you, you lost. I mean, I don't want to revisit that, but <laughs> how many times are we losing Corvallis? A couple of key times, yeah, right? Good. Where you win that no, game. The same, the same play as the UCLA, the three-step drop booty. Per, uh, no, I don't know. Right. Uh, well, let's not talk about it. Every team has those games. And yeah. you know what? Sure. It's kind of, is your glass half empty or is it half full? Yeah, listen, I'm a glass to half. It's, I, like, I, I, I'm from the the Bob Knight, you know, <laughs> the discipline, I, and I'm the glass is half effing gone kind of guy. Okay. I, I have a problem with, uh, I, I think defense has been devalued as a whole. You know, we were, the defensive, the, look, the defensive, the linebacker and the defensive line, those are kind of the authoritarians of the team. That's just the way it is. That's the way teams are made up. And they're kind of losing that. And, like, I know it might – like, look, our quarterback, we ran option. Our quarterback actually like, got hit in practice. It was – it's different now. But it, it was kind of like – like I, I, can't, gee, I can't imagine – can you imagine one of us told our thing to, rut, to calm the F down, one of our coaches? I mean, it's just – it's not – and we've elevated that now we specialize this side of the ball, and now we kick you out if you hit them too hard. And it's just – it's just devalued the whole thing. And I think that's why you see, like, our defense this year, I see more of the might as well go for the strip. That's the only chance we got. Because if we tackle, I mean, you, you can't rush the passer nine times in a row. Well, you just but, hold on, hold on, wait, I got to stop you there. That's what caused the debacle in Las Vegas is guys were playing out, were playing, trying to take too much on themselves, not just make, right. wrapping, make a simple tackle and trying to strip the ball out. Uh, that game, I'm not saying we win that game with a hobbled Caleb Williams but when you know there's a we all know the plays. I'm, I'm not gonna name the players. I'm, there was a massive play in the game. It was a long third down. We could have stopped them, got them out on the punt. Somebody decides you're gonna try to be play hero ball and try to strip the ball. Uh, and the guy runs in for a touchdown. Or I can't no, remember. No, Maybe. No, it was like, here, let me try this, or I gotta or I better just save my energy. It, it's like what if it's I, it's like home run, don't get this or they score, at least we get off the field and save our energy. Like that, that's literally an acceptable way to play now. I, I mean, I can't, I just don't get it. And I just think as long as that's emphasized, like I said, like I said in the other comment, Georgia and Bama can't stop anybody now. No one can stop anybody. You can't there's if you don't pay a price for running over the middle, coaches like Riley just get, drag and throw up to an open spot. They cannot outrun a receiver and a sprint to the uh, opposite side of the field. It, it just it's it's how it's X to node now. And it's just it now I'm like I think maybe Grinch is right because Maybe have Tui stand out there and get in the way because at least they have to account for him. It'll mess up their blocking scheme. And like I said, he can't rush the passer nine times in a row anyway. So I, I mean, I don't, I hate it. I hate every bit of it, but I just, I, this, at least that's forward thinking. And I don't, like I said, I have no reason why you need two receivers coach and no special teams coach. But this guy coached four Heisman winners. He knows more than I do. So just keep doing what you're doing, Paul. But it's just kind of foreign right. to me. Well, listen, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you calling in, Rob. Thank we have a couple both. more comments we got to get to. We've been here a little over an hour now. I apologize. I got the show a little bit late, but now we're still over. Even though we started 15 minutes late, we're still run, we're running over an hour for the show. So appreciate right you calling in. Thanks, man. All right on, man. Hope to see you next week. Um, okay, a couple more calls, and then we'll do it. Uh, uh, good point here. We have a we have a, a a Buckeye fan telling us that Bush deserves this. I mean, yeah, man. I don't think there's many people that argue with this. I mean, uh, uh, there might be some haters out there, but it's almost a slam dunk if you get this thing back, right, Rick? Hey, you know what's going to happen? Mark Emmert's gone. It'll happen um, sometime next year during the season or before the season. That's my 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 gut feel. And what then, do I um, I don't know anything? But that's my I think we were talking about I think we were talking about um Gary Patterson, uh Jim Leonard. That's all floating around. You know, it's there's gonna be a lot of speculation. Let's we just as fans, and I do it too, we need to see how this season plays out. We have no idea how this new group of guys is gonna play under Grinch. Um, there are gonna be a lot of I tell you what, if Grinch for whatever reason were not to work out the way that this administration has uh decided they want to play big boy football. And go after uh, look at what they did as far as uh, going to the Big Ten, hiring Lincoln Riley. I'm not worried anymore about hires. We do not have the mistakes that were made under uh, Swan and Hayden going on. I think we can all take a deep breath and realize that we have adults running the show now, 
and that if there is a need to move to on to a different defense coordinator, which at this point there is not, um, that I'm sure that we'll be in good hands with uh, Mike Bone making decisions. Yeah, and I, and and um, again, like look at Alabama. How many analysts do they, those guys hire? They want to get better. That's that's who they are. They are not going to uh, leave any. Nick Saban is not going to leave any stone unturned. He is looking for every competitive advantage he can in the SEC and you know in college football itself. Look at their look at his record. Okay, if Gary Patterson, you know, he leaves Texas. Why wouldn't Lincoln Riley at least give him a call? You need to get better on the defensive side of the ball. You're not, I'm not advocating for him to come in and change the scheme. No, just give him a phone call. See if he'd be interested in providing his analysis. Again, being an analyst, <clears throat> helping out scouting teams, scouting USC's talent, um, maybe giving his thoughts on potential portal players. I don't know, but getting better defensively. And he's the CEO. If Grinch has hurt feelings, you have a conversation with him. You know, we're trying to get better on this side of the ball, and we're going to do everything in our power to do it because we're here to win championships. His words, that's Lincoln Riley's words, not mine. But that's the expectation at USC. And for the longest time, it hasn't been. Yeah. And uh, let's say these really quickly. John says it curves a little light, but he hits like he's 235. That's that old saying, right? It's not the size of the dog of the fight. It's the size of the fight of right. the dog. Um, one of the oldest cliches in the world. Uh, D-Rock, awesome. Thank you so much. Great Irish fan here. I like the current West Coast times for these shows. Can't be around when it starts at 11 p.m. on the East Coast. Yeah, that's the thought we had with it. We yep. wanted to start a little bit earlier because we know we have Trojans and uh, Irish fans like yourself that might be interested, so we wanted to make it convenient a little bit earlier for everybody else. Hey, thanks, and, D-Rock uh, Irish. We appreciate the comment. And, yeah, we'll be here again next week at 5 o'clock. Um, and Hopefully at 5 and not 5.15. But, hey, opening night, got some uh, details to work out. And, Tim, freaking awesome work, dude. Right. Yeah, and one more. Uh, so, so uh, took Cushing three years. LFG, thank you. Took Cushing three years to lift and grow into his role. Uh, let's be careful. I think this might be a troll. I'm not sure. But uh, you got to remember one thing is Cushing got hurt. So you, you have to realize that the dude got hurt early on. Uh, I think it was a shoulder, actually. And uh, that probably stunted his ability to get on and be 100%. Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure if this is a well-played troll or not. But, yes, he did a lot of lifting in three years to roll, grow into his role. Correct. I'm not touching that, Rick, and I hope you don't either. Let's <laughs> don't go, go the next one. <laughs> right. Um, no, I think that's really it. Oh, well, one more here. Sorry. All right. Um, from, from Guy or Guy. I, I think that uh, defense will be a lot better this year. It's not that much. It's not that. Sorry. I know that's not saying much. Yeah, agreed. Uh, we all know there are problems. We also there are problems stemming back. You can't just walk into a room and you have to work with what you have. I think they've made some significant upgrades um, at all levels of the defense. I'm hoping that this will translate into uh, better production, maybe getting that uh, score per game down to the very low 20s. I don't think we need to have a, a top 20 defense to make make a run at the playoffs. I mean, I don't mean we're going to win the playoffs, right? But I think we can make a run at maybe even get into the playoffs with a top 50 defense, the way our offense is going to score. Thoughts, Rick? Yeah, absolutely right. So top 50 defense, I think that is the key. I, gave, we, I believe we gave up 29 points a game last year. But uh, if you look at the last four games, we could give up. 40 burgers, three of those games. Um, so if uh, we get that number down to giving up 23, 24 points a game, we'll be have a solid opportunity, a realistic opportunity to uh, be sustainable and have a real shot at, at getting to the Pac-12 championship and qualifying for the playoff, you know, albeit injury-free. Yeah. So, again, I want to thank you all um, for coming. Uh, it was a great show. There were some kinks that we're going to get out of this. Uh, we usually have our tech guru, which is Tony. Uh, we did not have him, but I had to shuffle and redo all the slides about what Rick, about five minutes before the show started. So uh, we have that out of the way. Now we know what format we need for the slides. Uh, and hopefully next week we can get this thing off smoother. Thank you all so much again for uh, tuning in to Trojan Conquest Live. Again, this is the show you guys asked for. This is what you guys want in the off season. And uh, we were able to ask Mark. Thank you, Mark to give you guys a voice. Please tell all your friends. We want to grow the show. 
Please leave a like and a comment if you could, and that would also help to grow the show. Any last thoughts, Rick? Yeah, appreciate you being here. Like, subscribe, bring a few friends. We'll be here again next um, next uh, Sunday, 5 p.m. If there's any ideas that you would like to hear discussed or have questions about what's happening during spring ball, like Tim said, put them in the comments. We'll check that. And uh, we look forward to producing a great show for you every week. Thanks for uh, stopping by and fight on. Bye to everyone.